Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we are going. I'm going to present a new topic in cardiovascular system, and this topic is known as the uh, heart failure, which is known as the congestive heart failure. So, so far in cardiovascular system, we have covered uh, the different topics like we have seen about uh, the hypertension, we have seen about uh, coronary artery disorders, which includes angina, myocardial infection, and so on. And also we have covered about the cardiac arrhythmias. So our next topic in um, cardiovascular system is heart failure. Okay. So I can say that this is one of the most important topics because um, a lot of patients who have this cardiac problems, they get admitted in the hospitals with heart failure. Okay, so with congestive heart failure. So let's have a look what is meant by this congestive heart failure and what is the main pathophysiology of this congestive heart failure and how we can manage uh, this congestive heart failure. So when once the patients, they get presented. Okay, so at first I will begin my uh, slide. I will present my slide. So our topic for today is heart failure. And in heart failure, so these are the uh, topics that we are going to cover today. Okay. So first of all, we are going to have a look through what is the pathophysiology of heart failure. Okay. So what happens in case of the heart failure? And then we will see the difference between the right-sided and the left-sided heart failure. So what is the major difference between the right and the left-sided heart failure? And also, we will have a look through the risk factors. So what are the main risk factors that leads to cause this heart failure? So here, when it comes to the risk factors, especially we emphasize on the medications, like are there any medications that leads to cause this heart failure? Are there any medications that are contraindicated in heart failure conditions? Okay. And then we will enter or we will uh, see about the pharmacology. That is what medications that can be used to treat this heart failure. So that is nothing but complete classification of the drugs as well as their mechanism of actions, everything that we'll cover in the pharmacology of uh heart failure medications then we'll go through the applied pharmacotherapy okay so applied pharmacotherapy is nothing but here we will uh, select an appropriate drug okay based on the case scenarios which are provided okay so at the end i'm going to present the case scenarios as well so in that case scenarios we will select the appropriate uh medication to the patient based on the current patient's condition and after selecting the drug, there are also other factors that may lead uh, that we need to uh, that we must follow it up. That is nothing but the monitoring parameters. So, what monitoring is to be done to the patients once after we select the uh, drug therapy? Okay. So now let's begin with the uh, first part. That is the pathophysiology of the heart failure. Okay. So heart failure, it is a complex syndrome which impairs the ability of the cardiac ventricles to pump adequate quantity of the blood to the systemic circulation. Okay, So or the adequate quantity of the blood to the body tissues. So what happens in case of heart failure is the heart it can't pump a sufficient amount, that is the required amount of the blood uh, to the body organs. Okay? And this heart failure, it can also be termed as a congestive heart failure. Okay, So congestive means if there is any fluid accumulated in the body, then we'll tell it as a congestive condition, congestion. Okay, So this congestion, it leads to cause, like, like the fluid gets accumulated either in the peripheral regions of the body, okay? so which may lead to cause the peripheral edema, like especially in case of heart failure, we can notice the ankle edema, okay? or the fluid, it gets accumulated in the lungs. Okay. And where it is to cause the pulmonary edema, okay, where the uh, patient they have a shortness of breath, and so on. Okay, so there are certain factors that may uh, cause this heart failure. So which include the coronary artery disease. In case if the patient they already have CAT problems, then there will be at a high risk of heart failure. Okay, and hypertension. Okay. If the uncontrolled hypertension, then it is also a risk factor for heart failure, valvular heart disease, anemia, hyperthyroidism, cardiomyopathies, congenital heart disease, and use of certain medications. Okay. So the use of certain medications, which is the most important one. So as a pharmacist, okay, so our major role when we are working as a clinical pharmacist in the hospital, so our major role is we need to screen all the patients' medication, that is the home medications. So we need to reconcile the uh, medications. Okay. So in case when we are doing such uh, screening, or when we are doing the reconciliation, if we find any of the 
medication that may leads to or that may trigger the heart failure conditions, then immediately we need to identify the drug and let the doctors know about it. Okay, so that the doctors they will deprescribe that medication. Okay, so deprescribe in the sense they will uh, remove that medication and replace it with some other medications. Okay, so here are some examples um, of medication that may precipitate the heart failure condition. So the first class of the drugs are calcium channel blockers. So in calcium channel blockers, there are two different types. One is the dihydropyridine, and the second one is the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So dihydropyridine examples are the uh, amlodipine, nifedipine, nicardipine. They all are the examples for dihydro peritine calcium channel blockers. So they got the name because they contain a dihydropyridine ring in its structure. And then the non-dihydropyridines are virapamil and diltiazem. So dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, they mainly show the action on the blood vessels. Okay? It means that they relax the blood vessels. Whereas virapamil and diltiazem, which are non-dihydropyridine, they mainly show the action on the cardiac myocytes. They show the action on the heart. And the main function is they have a negative inotropic property. Okay. So negative inotropic means inotropic in the sense force of contraction. So virapamil and diltiazem, they reduce the force of contraction. Okay. So that's why we are telling it as a negative inotropic property. Okay. So positive inotropic means increase in the force of contraction. A negative inotropic means decrease in the force of contraction. So here virapamil and diltiazem, they are reducing the force of contraction. So that's why these drugs, they have a negative inotropic property. So these drugs may further, they may exaggerate or they may further precipitate the heart failure condition. Then the second class of the drugs that may uh, precipitate the heart failure are corticosteroids and anesthetes. So corticosteroids and anesthetes, they have a common property, like they cause the sodium and water retention in the body. Okay, And we know that in case of heart failure, if the fluid gets accumulated, like more water gets reabsorbed at the nephrons, then the heart, the preload on the heart will get increased. Okay? As a result, the heart can't pump the blood properly. Okay, So this is another uh, uh, like risk factors okay so that may precipitate the heart failure so patients who are on steroids and anesthetes they are also at a risk of increased heart failure okay? then the next class of the drugs is the thiazolidinediones rosiglitazone and pioglitazone so these two drugs are the examples for thiazolidinediones so rosiglitazone like both the drugs thiazolidinediones both rosiglitazone and pioglitazone, they are considered as the oral hypoglycemic agents. They are used in the management of type 2 diabetes. Okay. So rosiglitazone is completely removed from the market because rosiglitazone has got a high risk of fluid retention in the body. So it causes a high fluid retention in the body. Okay. So as a result, the patient, they develop the uncontrolled hypertension as well as the patient, they will have this heart failure problems because fluid is getting accumulated in the body. So patients, those who have the heart failure problems, they should not be on thiazolidinediones. And then finally, uh, the other class of the drugs are anthracycline antibiotics, doxorubicin and danorubicin. So both the anthracyclines, these drugs, they are used, uh, they, they are the anti-cancer drugs. So these drugs, they have the cardiac, card, cardiotoxic effects. And one of the side effects of these drugs. One of the cardiotoxic effects is they precipitate the heart failure. Okay. So these are the few important drugs that may precipitate the heart failure. Okay. Now, this heart failure, it can be categorized into two types. So one is the systolic heart failure and the other is the diastolic heart failure. So systolic in the sense, systole means contraction. So in case of systolic heart failure, the cardiac muscles or the cardiac myocytes, they fail to undergo proper contraction. There is a forceful contraction. Okay. Whereas in case of diastolic heart failure, the cardiac myocytes, the cardiac muscles, they fail to undergo proper relaxation. Okay. So they won't get relaxed properly. Okay. So diastolic phase is also much important because if the muscles, they won't get like 
the ventricle ventricular muscles if they won't get relaxed properly then the ventricles they won't get filled with the blood okay so if the muscles if the ventricles are not relaxed then the ventricular chambers won't get filled with the blood properly if the chambers are not getting filled then the cardiac output will get reduced okay so we can categorize the heart failure as systolic and diastolic heart failure okay? and we can also categorize this heart failure as left sided and right sided heart failure based on the side of the heart which is getting affected okay so which side of the heart is getting affected either the left ventricle or the right ventricle has got affected okay so the cardinal symptoms the main symptoms of the left sided heart failure is dyspnea okay that is shortness of breath due to pulmonary congestion and the cardinal symptom or the main symptom of the right sided heart failure is peripheral edema that is ankle swelling or congestion in the liver okay so how left sided heart failure it causes a uh, shortness of breath okay and how the right sided heart failure it leads to cause uh, ankle edema as well as congestion in the liver so everything that we'll uh, study in the next slide okay so with the help of a diagram we'll come to know how uh, left sided and the right sided they leads to cause the pulmonary and peripheral edema respectively okay. and most of the times the patients they present with a biventricular failure okay. biventricular in the sense they will have both left sided and right sided failure okay. so left sided that is the left ventricular and right ventricular failure okay so that's why we'll tell it as a biventricular failure okay so now let's have a look through uh what is left sided heart failure and what is right sided heart failure and why left sided is causing the shortness of breath and why right sided is causing the ankle edema okay so this diagram it represents so here in this diagram which is the uh, structure of the heart okay so we can divide the heart into right sided and left sided so this part the uh, blue bluish color part Okay. so has got the right atrium and the right ventricle because the veins which are bringing the blood okay, so which are bringing the impure blood that is the deoxygenated blood okay. so we have got two major veins one is the superior vena cava and the other is the inferior vena cava so the main function of these two vena cavas is to bring or to collect the impure blood from all over uh, from uh, throughout the body and they will bring that impure blood to the right atrium superior vena cava it brings the impure blood from the upper part of the body whereas the inferior vena cava it brings the blood from the lower part of the body okay so they bring the blood to the right atrium from the right atrium the blood enters into the right ventricle from the right ventricle during right ventricular systole that is contraction the blood which is present in the right ventricular chamber it will pump it will get pumped into the pulmonary artery okay so pulmonary artery is the only artery in the in our body which carries impure blood or deoxygenated blood okay so the blood which is present in the right ventricle during right ventricular systole it gets pumped into the pulmonary artery from pulmonary artery the blood reaches to the lungs where it gets purified and the purified or oxygenated blood with the help of pulmonary veins it reaches to the left atrium okay so pulmonary veins are the only veins in our body which brings the pure blood or oxygenated blood okay. so now the blood reaches to the left atrium from the left atrium during left atrial systole the blood enters into the left ventricle and during left ventricular systole that is contraction the blood which is present in the left ventricle it will be pumped into the aorta okay. from aorta the blood enters into the arteries okay and it gets circulated throughout the body that is the blood will enter into the systemic circulation so this is the overall uh, structure of the heart so here what we can uh, do is if we divide the heart into the right side and the left side so clearly we can see that on the right side always the deoxygenated blood gets circulated and on the left side always the oxygenated blood gets circulated okay so now let's have a look through what happens in case of the left sided heart failure and what happens exactly in case of right sided heart failure okay so in this diagram again um we can represent that 
Okay, so at first, let's assume that the patient has got a right ventricular failure. Okay, so right ventricular failure, failure in the sense the patient's uh, right ventricle is not contracting properly. Okay, so the systole is not uh, occurring properly. Okay, so as a result, what happens is the blood which is present in the right ventricular chamber, so it remains within the right ventricle. Okay, so it means that it won't get remained like the complete blood won't get uh, uh, recited within the right ventricle. Okay, so in case of uh, heart failure, that is the systolic heart failure, a portion of the blood, okay, it still gets uh, retained within the right ventricle. Okay, so the severity of the heart failure, that is the systolic heart failure, it depends on uh, how severe the heart failure it is. That is the percentage of the blood that retains in the uh, chambers. It depends on uh, how much uh, like how severe the heart failure it is okay so that everything that i will explain you in uh, when we talk about the ejection fraction in the next slide okay so now let's assume that the right ventricular systolic failure that is the right ventricle has failed to pump the blood properly into the pulmonary artery okay as a result this uh, the blood it remains within the right ventricle okay and that blood it exerts a pressure on the right atrium okay so as a result, the right atrium during atrial systole, the blood which is present in the right atrium, it won't enter into the right ventricle. Okay? So the blood resides within the right atrium. Okay? And as the blood resides in the right atrium, so what happens here is, so the blood which is present in the right atrium, it exerts a pressure on the blood which is present in the vena cavas. Okay, so the vena cavas, which are collecting the blood, especially the inferior vena cava, which is bringing the blood from the lower part of the bodies. Okay, so it can't bring or it can't dump the blood into the right atrium. Okay, because already the right atrial chamber is filled with the blood. Okay, so finally, what happens is that the blood which is present in the inferior vena cava, so this blood will be pulled back. Okay, so it, it will be pulled back, that is, the blood will. Uh, come back to the lower limbs okay and it gets accumulated that is the plasma or the fluid gets accumulated up over there and it leads to cause the peripheral swelling or the peripheral edema okay so finally in case of right side heart failure if it is a right ventricular failure okay then uh, the blood which is present in the inferior vena cava okay? so uh, the blood which is present in the inferior vena cava it won't uh, like it, it won't uh, enter properly into the right atrium. And as a result, it leads to cause the peripheral edema in the patient. Okay, The most common is the ankle swelling. So now let's have a look through the left-sided heart failure. In case if the left ventricle has uh, failed to undergo a proper contraction, that is the systole. Now what happens is due to the failure of uh, contraction, most of the blood it gets retained within the left ventricular chamber. Okay. As a result, it exerts a pressure on the left atrium. So the left atrium further it exerts a pressure on the pulmonary veins. Okay, so it means that the blood which is present, which is coming from lungs to the pulmonary veins. Okay, so actually the blood flows in this way, like from pulmonary artery, the blood will enter into the lungs. So the blood gets purified over there, and the purified blood from the lungs it comes back through pulmonary veins. But here, due to this pressure, the blood which is present in the pulmonary veins, it won't uh, enter into the left atrium properly. So blood gets retained here in the lungs. Okay, And it leads to cause the pulmonary congestion. That is, fluid gets accumulated in the lungs and the patient, they develop the shortness of breath. Okay, So in this way, in case of the left ventricular failure or the left side heart failure, the patients, they will have pulmonary congestion or the shortness of breath. Okay, So right side heart failure, that is the right ventricular failure, leads to cause peripheral congestion. That is, uh, it leads to cause ankle edema. And the left side heart failure, it leads to cause the pulmonary congestion. That is, uh, fluid gets accumulated in the lungs and the patients, they complain of the shortness of breath. Okay, so this is the major difference between the left side and the right sided heart failure. Okay, so now let's have a look through the uh, short MCQ. Okay, the shortness of breath, which we'll tell it as the dyspnea, can be noticed in which side of the heart failure. 
okay, at the right side or left side? So the answer is left-sided heart failure. Okay. Then the peripheral edema, especially the ankle swelling, can be noticed in which side of the heart failure, at the right side or left side? So we know that peripheral uh, edema, that is the ankle swelling, can be noticed in case of right-sided heart failure. Okay. Then now we need to know about uh, a major factor, which is known as the ejection fraction of the heart. Okay. Because each and every time that uh, when we study about the medications, especially about the rituxin and its uh, uh, mechanism of action and everything, so there we need to know about this ejection fraction. Okay, So we need to know what is meant by this ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is the fraction of the blood which is ejected out during each ventricular systole. Okay, So that is during left ventricular systole, left ventricular contraction, or the left ventricular systole, how much percentage of the blood is ejected into the iota? Okay. So how much percentage of the blood is getting ejected into the iota, that is into the systemic circulation, is known as ejection fraction. Okay. So the same thing that we also measure for the right ventricle. Okay. So how much percentage of the blood that is entering into the pulmonary artery? But the important one is the left ventricle because this is the like left-sided heart failure is the most common type of the heart failure when compared to that of right-sided heart failure. Okay, so the percentage of the blood that enters into the iota or into the systemic circulation is known as the ejection fraction. Okay? So in a normal healthy heart, in a normal healthy heart, okay, so the left ventricle it pumps up to seventy percentage of the blood. So that is 70% of the blood which is present in the left ventricle will be pumped into the iota or into the systemic circulation. Okay. So that is the normal ejection fraction of the heart. Okay. It means that still 30% of the blood will retain inside the ventricular chamber. Okay. So that's fine. But in case of heart failure condition, in case of heart failure, what happens is so that ejection fraction it gets reduced. Okay, from seventy percent, the ejection fraction will reduce to fifty percent, or the ejection fraction will reduce to forty percent. Okay, so the uh, the reduction in the percentage it depends on the severity of the heart failure. Okay, so if it is reduced to fifty percent, then we'll tell it as yeah the patient has got the heart failure problem, but it has reduced to forty percent. Then we'll tell it as that, yeah, he has got a more severe heart failure condition. But it has reduced to 35% or 30%, then it is highly severe condition. Okay. So in this way, as the percentage of the blood which is pumped out, which is the ejection fraction, okay. So as the ejection fraction it gets reduced, then the severity of the heart failure will will uh, classify it as the heart failure is the most it, it is in much severe condition okay then here as i mentioned that a healthy heart uh, will eject up to 70% of the blood 60 to 70% but in case of systolic failure that is uh, systole means contraction so in case of systolic failure this ejection fraction will be reduced to 40% okay? in severe heart failure condition it may further reduce to 35% but in more severe conditions it may even reduce to less than 30 percent it means that only 30 percent of the blood will be pumped out okay which means that 70 percent of the blood is residing within the left ventricular chamber so when only 30 percent or when only 35 or 40 percent is getting pumped out uh, the bell the blood may not reach to all the organs in our body okay so it may not reach to all the organs in our body and the oxygen supply to all the organs in the body will get reduced. Okay. So that's the um, common uh, problem that we can see in case of the heart failure. Okay. So now our main treatment goals. So what are the treatment goals for the management of this heart failure? So for the management of the heart failure, the first goal is to remove any risk factors if there are any underlying risk factors are present then we must try to remove those risk factors okay so especially when when it comes to the risk factors as a pharmacist so our main 
target, our main goal, our uh, main responsibility is to identify if there are any medications that are causing this heart failure, or if there are any medications that are that may precipitate the heart failure. Okay, so that's the major role of the pharmacist. Okay? So, like the patient, they um, most of the patients, especially if they are elder patients. Okay, so elder patients, they will be on many medications. They will they will uh, be in a poly pharmacy condition like they will take more than five medications okay so we need to assess properly is there any of the medications that may leads to cause the heart failure or that may precipitate further heart failure uh, in the patient okay so that's the uh, one of the major roles of the pharmacist okay so that's our first goal in the management of heart failure then the second goal is to you relieve from the symptoms of congestion. So in case of heart failure, we know that the patients, if they have the right-sided heart failure, then they will have pulmonary congestion and they will have shortness of breath. And sorry, if they have left-sided heart failure, then they have pulmonary congestion and shortness of breath. And if they have right-sided heart failure, then they will have peripheral congestion, that is peripheral edema, like ankle swelling and so on. Okay. So our main target at first, we must give some relief from the congestion. So to give relief from the congestion means we must try to remove that fluid, excess fluid from the body. Okay. So the excess fluid is getting accumulated. So we must try to remove that excess fluid from the body. Then the third goal is to optimize the life prolonging therapy. Okay. So how we can uh, improve the survival of the patient? Okay. So that is our third goal. And final goal is to promote healthy lifestyle. Like we need to ask the patient to avoid uh, taking excess of salt and all those conditions, which are non-pharmacological methods. They come under the fourth uh, goal. Okay. So the first goal is to identify any risk factors and remove those risk factors. The second goal is to give uh, relief from the symptoms, okay, which is the main or the first step that we need to do in case if the patient have the congestion. And then the third goal is to promote the life prolonging therapies. And then the fourth goal is to promote a healthy lifestyle to the patient. Okay. So now let's have a look through how we can achieve these goals. Okay. So this is an overall uh, classification of the drugs that can be used for the management of heart failure. Okay. And our goals that we have seen in the previous slide we can achieve through these medications. Okay. So to relieve the congestion, congestion to relieve the congestion means to remove that excess fluid from the body. Okay. So what we can do is we can give diuretics to the patients. Okay. So providing diuretics to the patients is the best method through which we can remove that excess fluid from the body. Okay. And the diuretics that we use here are the loop diuretics. Okay, not the thiazide or any other class of the diuretics. Okay. So loop diuretics will provide, like loop diuretics are the diuretic that helps to remove that excess fluid from the body and they help to uh, provide some relief from congestion. Okay. So the examples for the loop diuretics are frusamide, bumetanide. Okay. And then, however, in the next slide, we will see the complete classification of the diuretics as well. Okay. Then the next goal, as we have seen in the previous slide, so to the the first goal is to uh, identify and remove the risk factors. Okay, so that uh, this goal we will study in detail in the form of a case study at the end. Okay, then our second goal is to provide relief from symptoms of congestion, and in order to relieve the symptoms of congestion, we can give diuretics to the patient, and then our next goal is to optimize life prolonging therapies and to optimize the life prolonging therapies so what we can do is so we can give some medications okay so we can give certain drugs that can arrest or reverse the disease progression so these are the drugs that they prevent further disease progression and also they help to prolong the survival of the patient they help in increasing the life of the patient so the examples for the drugs are, the first one is the ACE inhibitors, captopril, enlapril, ramipril, lisinopril, perindopril, 
all are the examples for the ACE inhibitors. And if ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, then we can go with ARBs, angiotensin converting angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, candisartan, losartan, okay, adbisartan, all are the examples for the ARBs. And we can also achieve this goal by giving beta blockers to the patients. So the three main beta blockers that we use in heart failure are bisoprolol, metoprolol, and carvedilol. Okay. So BMC, bisoprolol, metoprolol, and carvedilol. So these three are the beta blockers that we use in heart failure. We, so we won't use other beta blockers for in the management of heart failure. And the next class of the drugs are aldosterone antagonists. They are also known as potassium-sparing diuretics. Examples are spinolactone and epilirinone. So we can also give spinolactone and epilirinone. So these drugs, they also have the property to prevent further disease progression and they can prolong the survival or the life of the patient. And the last one is, it is a uh, recent drug, like recently they have introduced into the market, like uh, five, six years back. So that is the Neptrilacin inhibitor with sartan combination. Okay, that is sacubitrol with valsartan. So this sacubitrol with valsartan, this drug, it should be given only at the last stage, like when ACE inhibitor plus beta blocker and other drugs combination, they fail to show improvement, then only the doctors, they will put the patient on sacubitrol with valsartan. But before putting the patient on sacubitrol with valsartan, so what we need to do is we must stop ACE inhibitor, okay, or ARB. So ACE inhibitors are one of the first line drugs in heart failure management. Okay, so heart failure patients they must be on ACE inhibitor. So this is one of the first uh, and the most important drug. The patient must be on ACE inhibitors. At the same time, they must also be on beta blockers. So ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. So these two classes of the drugs are like all the heart failure patients, they must be on these two classes of the drugs, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. And if ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, like the main contraindication for ACE inhibitor is once after starting the ACE inhibitor, if the patient develops dry cough, because one of the main side effects of the ACE inhibitors is ACE inhibitors, they cause the dry cough. If the patient develop the dry cough, then we can switch the patient from ACE inhibitor to ARBs. So let's say, for example, in initially, the patient is on enalapril. And after using enalapril, the patient has developed the dry cough. Then what we can do is we can stop enalapril and put the patient on any one of the satans. So finally, Patient with heart failure, they must be either on ACE inhibitor or ARBs plus beta blocker. Okay. ACE inhibitor plus beta blocker or a combination of ARB plus beta blocker. Okay. So let's assume that the patient is already on ACE inhibitor that is enalapril with bisoprolol combination. So even with these two drug combination, the patient's symptoms are not getting improved then only the doctors, they will decide to switch over to sacubitrol with valsartan. But before switching over from uh, switching over to sacubitrol with valsartan, so what they will do is they will ask the patient to stop taking this enalapril. Okay. So they will ask the patient to stop taking enalapril. And after stopping the enalapril, the patient must wait at least 36 hours Okay. Or ideally, we will uh, ask the patient to wait for two days okay, to start using sacubitrol with valsartan combination. Okay. So in the market, it is available with a brand name known as the Entresto. So it means that before starting the Entresto, the patient must stop taking whatever will be the drug the patient is using, either ACE inhibitor or ARB. Okay. So the patient must stop this drug and then wait for 36 hours. And after 36 hours, they can use this combination. So here, what happens in case if the patient has already took the morning dose of enalapril, 
And in the evening, the patient took the circubitral with valsartan combination. That is the Entresto tablet. Okay. So what happens here is there will be a high risk of hyperkalemia okay, and there will be a high risk of angioedema. So if the patient takes uh, ACE inhibitor and this new drug that is the combination drug, both together, then the risk of hyperkalemia and angioedema will be severe. Okay. So to avoid, because one of the common side effects of ACE inhibitors is ACE inhibitors, they cause hyperkalemia. They increase the serum potassium levels. The same side effect goes with ARBs as well, candisartan, losartan, ibisartan, okay, telmisartan. So all these drugs, they also have got the same property. They also increase the uh, serum potassium levels. So here already there is a valsartan. Okay, valsartan is nothing but it is also a type of satan. It is also an angiotensin two receptor blocker. So if we combine valsartan with ACE inhibitor both together, or if we combine valsartan with ebisartan both together, then the risk of severe hyperkalemia and angioedema will be higher in the patient. So that's why the patient must stop taking ACE inhibitor or ARB. So and need to wait at least 36 hours to start using this new drug. So all these drugs, either ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and aldosterone antagonist. So this aldosterone antagonist, actually this drug, spinolactone and epiridinone. So both the drugs, like we can put the patient on aldosterone antagonist. Okay. So only when ACE inhibitor and beta blocker combination is not showing much response, then we will, the doctors, they will decide to put the patient on spironolactone. So the therapy, it starts in this way. So at first they will put the patient on ACE inhibitor. And after putting the patient on ACE inhibitor, beta blocker is also a mandatory. It is a compulsory drug. They also start the patient on a beta blocker. So ACE inhibitor plus beta blocker combination. So even on this combination, after a few months, if the patient still complains about this heart failure symptoms, then what they will do is they will add another drug that is allosterone antagonist, that is spironolactone. So one of the main side effects of this spironolactone is spironolactone, it causes gynecomastia because it suppresses the androgen uh, levels in the body. So in males, it leads to cause the gynecomastia. So in case if that is the problem, then what they will do is they will switch over from spironolactone to epilirinone. So epilirinone is the drug which is free of such side effects. The main advantage of the epilirinone is epilirinone will have lesser side effects when compared to spironolactone. Okay. So that's why in case if the patient has developed any of the uh, spironolactone related side effects, then they will switch the patient over to epilirinone. But First, they will try with spironolactone. The reason is spironolactone is less expensive when compared to epilirinone. Okay. So all these drugs, the main function is they prevent further disease progression and they prevent further damage to the heart and they help in prolonging the life of the patient. Okay. Whereas the first class of the drugs, diuretics, so diuretics, they won't help in prolonging the life of the patient. They won't help in preventing the disease progression. So the diuretics only role, the uh, main function of the diuretics is just to remove the fluid from the body. Okay? So the only function is to remove that congestion, to give relief from congestion, to remove that excess fluid from the body. So that's the only function of the diuretics. And then the last class of the drug is cardiac the drugs that improve the cardiac output. So we know that the most famous drug in case of heart failure is digoxin. So digoxin is the drug that has got a positive inotropic property. Inotropic, as already I mentioned, inotropic means increase in the force of contraction. So digoxin will increase the force of contraction. Okay. So here, the important point that we need to know is digoxin is the drug that helps to improve the cardiac output, okay, only to improve the cardiac output, okay, because it has got a positive inotropic effect. But digoxin, it 
it won't uh, reverse or it won't prevent further disease progression. Okay. So digoxin's only function is to pump the blood. Okay. So to pump the blood out from the ventricles, it increases the force of contraction of the uh, ventricular myocytes, that is the ventricular muscles. So that's the only function of the digoxin, but digoxin, it won't uh, help to prevent further disease progression. Okay. So in detail about each class of the drugs that we'll have, uh, that we need to uh, go through it and how these drugs, they show the action. So that we'll study in the next slides. Okay. So this is an overall classification of the drugs that can be used for the management of heart failure. Okay. So now the first class of the drugs are the diuretics. So diuretics, as already we have studied uh, regarding these diuretics in detail in hypertension topic. So I'm not going to um, go in detail about all the diuretics, each and every diuretic here. Okay. So the most important diuretic that we need to emphasize for our present topic is the high ceiling diuretics. They're also known as high efficacy diuretics. Or they're also known as loop diuretics because these drugs, they show the action at the Henley's loop. Furosemide, which is the most common drug. So whenever the patients, they have the fluid accumulated in the body, either because of the heart failure condition or because of hepatic cirrhosis okay, or any condition, the patient have a fluid accumulated in the body, then the first drug that they, we will give to the patient is the furosemide. Okay. So it removes the excess fluid from the body. Okay. So in case of congestive heart failure, Loop diuretics are the main drugs, which helps to remove that excess fluid from the body. So we emphasize only on the loop diuretics in this topic. And there are also other diuretics like thiazide diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, chlorothalidone, metolazone, interpamide. Okay. But thiazide diuretics, they are known as a weak, like they are moderate diuretics. They are not that too strong to remove the excess fluid from the body. Okay. So that's why, we won't uh, give only thiazide diuretics in case if the patient has the pulmonary congestion or ankle edema, such symptoms, then we can't treat with thiazide diuretics. So the best drugs to treat is the loop diuretics. And there are also other class of the drugs which are known as the weak diuretics. Okay. Estrazolamide, which is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So we know that uh, estrazolamide is the drug that can be used in glaucoma. Already we have seen its mechanism of action, everything in the previous topics. And potassium sparing diuretics, allosterone antagonist. So this is the one, again, the spinolactone, it plays a major role in heart failure condition. So spinolactone and epilirinone, so both the drugs, they show a major role in heart failure. So how these drugs, they show the action, so that already we have seen in the previous uh, slide. That is the aldosterone antagonist, spironolactone and epilirinone. They are also known as potassium sparing diuretics. So they prevent further disease progression and prolong the survival of the patient. And then finally, the osmotic diuretics. So we are not going to cover about the osmotic diuretics here. Mannitol and glycerol. Osmotic diuretics are mainly used in uh, to reduce the intracranial pressure or to reduce the intraoptic pressure okay so here in this slide we can have a look through the mechanism of action of diuretics so we are not going to cover through all the classes of the diuretics so the only diuretic that we are going to emphasize here is the loop diuretics okay so loop diuretics like furosemide it shows the action on the henley's loop okay? so mainly at the ascending limb of the henley's loop which contains the sodium potassium chloride pump so loop diuretics will block this pump as a result, sodium won't get reabsorbed. Potassium won't get much of the potassium chloride. They won't get reabsorbed into the systemic circulation. So if sodium won't get reabsorbed, then osmosis won't occur. Okay? And if osmosis won't occur, then water won't enter into the plasma or into the fluid. Okay? So ultimately, we can reduce the blood volume. So the water which is present inside the uh, lumen of the nephron. So this water or the fluid which is present inside the uh, nephron, so the fluid will get excreted out. Okay. So in this way, loop diuretics, they 
try to remove the excess fluid from the body. Okay. So now, here are the examples of the loop diuretics. That is the high ceiling diuretics are also known as the high efficacy or the loop diuretics. Crucimide, which is the strong diuretic. Okay. So high ceiling diuretics like the frucimide are to be used only in case of the fluid overload. So whenever the patient has got the congestive heart failure or renal failure and in hepatic or in the liver cirrhosis conditions. So during all those conditions, so we need to put the patient on the loop diuretics okay? because loop diuretics will help to remove that excess fluid from the body. So frucimide, the dose of frucimide, it ranges from 20 milligram and it may go even up to 500 milligram daily. Okay. So in hospital setups, when once the patient, they get admitted in the hospitals with severe heart failure conditions, and when they have the shortness of breath due to fluid accumulated in the lungs. So in that condition, the doctors, they may also put the patient on a higher dose that is up to 500 milligram of frucimide. And it is also available in the form of the intravenous drug, IV frucimide. So the dose, it can range from 20 milligram, okay, 40 milligram, 80 milligram, 160 milligram, 250 milligram, or even up to 500 milligram daily. Okay. But always remember that when we put the patient on a higher dose of frucimide, our main target, our goal is to reduce the dose of the frucimide and bring it back to as low as possible. Okay. So let's say, for example, if you, if you are starting, if you if you are trying to put the patient on 160 milligram of frucimide, then what the doctors they will advise the patient is to uh, come and visit the patient within a uh, couple of weeks, like within two weeks. Then again they will uh, reassess the patient and they will reduce the dose to 80 milligram. If there is further improvement in the symptoms, then they will reduce from 80 to 40. And again they will ask the patient to revisit after one or two months. So if there is still further improvement, then they will cut down the dose to 20 milligram. So it means that always we must try to bring back the frucimide dose to as low as possible. So we should not put a patient on a high dose of frucimide for a long term. Okay, Because if long term, if the patient is on a higher doses of frucimide, then frucimide's only function is to remove that excess fluid from the body. It causes the diuresis. It removes the excess fluid from the body. So the patient becomes hypovolemic. So that's the major risk associated with frucimide. And also frucimide, it causes a lot of uh, mineral abnormalities in the body. It causes hypomagnesemia. It causes hyponatremia. It causes uh, hypokalemia, that is decrease in the potassium levels. And also it causes hypocalcemia, that is decrease in the serum calcium levels. So all those are the major side effects that are associated with frucimide. So that's why we must try to put the patient at a very low dose of frucimide. And if the patient's symptoms are completely improved, then we need to stop, that is de-prescribe the frucimide. Okay. Now, the uses of the frucimide or any of the high ceiling diuretics is, they can be used in edema. Right? Whenever the patient has the swelling, then we can give frucimide to the patient to remove that excess fluid from the body and in acute pulmonary edema as well. Okay. So whenever the fluid gets accumulated in the lungs, then even sometimes we can go with the intravenous frucimide to remove that excess fluid from the body, which gives uh, relief to the patient. Then the adverse effects of the diuretics. So diuretics, they cause the hypokalemia. As already we have covered all these adverse effects in our previous uh, topics. So diuretics, they cause the hypokalemia, that is they decrease the serum potassium levels. And loop diuretics, only loop diuretics like frucimide, it has got an ototoxic property. Especially when we combine frucimide with another ototoxic drug, the best example is aminoglycoside antibiotics, okay? like gentamicin, amikacin. Okay? So all are the examples for aminoglycoside antibiotics. So when we combine frucimide with aminoglycoside antibiotics, then the risk of ototoxicity, that is hearing loss, okay, will be more severe. Then the other side effect is allergic reactions because frucimide in the structure, it contains sulfur in it. Even thiazide diuretics, they contain sulfur in it. 
So due to the presence of sulfur, these drugs lead to cause the photosensitivity reactions and skin rashes. And hyperuricemia. So these drugs, they increase the uric acid levels and they may precipitate gout in the patient. So all these are the all these are few of the uh, adverse effects that are associated with the diuretics. Okay. Then the next class of the drugs are ACE inhibitors. Okay. So, so far, what we have done is, I'm going back to the previous slide. So this is the slide which represents all the classes of the drugs which can be used for the management of heart failure. Okay. So the first class of the drug is the drugs which gives relief from congestion. Okay. The best example are the diuretics. So we have covered about diuretics. Okay. And then the next drugs are the drugs that prevent further disease progression or the drugs which improve or they prolong the survival of the patient are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonist, and sacubitril valsartan. So we are going to cover about these drugs now. So ACE inhibitors, captopril, enlapril, ramipril, lisinopril, perintopril, all are the examples for ACE inhibitors. So we know the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors. They mainly block the angiotensin converting enzyme. By blocking the angiotensin converting enzyme, they prevent the formation of angiotensin 2. Okay. So the advantages of using the ACE inhibitors are ACE inhibitors, especially in heart failure, they prevent cardiac remodeling. So cardiac remodeling is a condition where cardiac myocytes, that is the cardiac muscles, after myocardial infraction, that is after heart attack, or after congestive heart failure, that is heart failure, our current topic. Okay? So cardiac myocytes, they change in their size, they change in the mass, and they change in the function. Okay? So their size, shape, and the function will be changed. Okay, so for, uh, ultimately or finally, it leads to cause a decrease in the function, and fun it leads to cause a decrease in the function of the ventricles, and it may lead to cause the ventricular arrhythmias in the patient. Okay, so that condition is known as the cardiac remodeling. So I will explain you in detail with the diagram in the next slide. Okay, and. By putting the patient on an ACE inhibitor, so if, if a patient has the heart failure problem, and if we put the patient on the ACE inhibitor, then these ACE inhibitors, they prevent such cardiac remodeling. That is, they prevent change in the size, shape, mass, and the functions of the heart. So if, if that changes occurs, then the heart will develop a new problem, which is known as the arrhythmias. So from heart failure condition, the patient will end up with another problem, and that problem is known as the cardiac arrhythmias, ventricular arrhythmias. Okay. And so that's the main reason why we must put the patient on ACE inhibitors. And then the ACE inhibitors, they also uh, enhance the renal blood flow. They improve the renal blood flow. So and ACE inhibitors, they prevent the diabetic nephropathy. So that's the another reason why in all the diabetic patients, the main drug of choice, okay? So the main drug of choice is they put the patient on ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors are considered as the first line agents in diabetic patients because ACE inhibitors, they prevent diabetic nephropathy in the patients. And then, ACE inhibitor, they have a capacity to regress left ventricular or the vascular hypertrophy. So ACE inhibitors are considered as the first line drugs in patients with myocardial infarction, congestive heart failure, or coronary artery disorders. So as already we have covered in our previous topics, so whenever the patient have any of the other cardiovascular problems, so if a patient is a diabetic, uh, sorry, if a patient is a hypertensive patient, Along with hypertension, if the patient has any other problems like myocardial infarction, that is heart attack, or congestive heart failure, okay, 
or uh, angina pectoris. So any other problems, then ACE inhibitors are to be considered as the first line agents in the patient. Okay. Now, regarding the ventricular remodeling, that as we have seen here, ACE inhibitors, they prevent cardiac uh, remodeling. Okay. So that is ACE inhibitors, they prevent the left ventricular hypertrophy. So what is meant by this cardiac remodeling? What is meant by the left ventricular hypertrophy? So in this diagram, we can have a look through this diagram. Okay. So this is the normal size of the heart, normal shape of the heart. So here in this normal heart, so we can see the size of the left ventricle. But here on the right hand side, you can see uh, the left ventricle has undergone hypertrophy. That is the enlarged in size. So what happened here is, here the left ventricular size, shape, and ultimately the function has been changed. Okay, So the size, shape, and its function has been reduced. Okay, So the size and shape have increased and its function has been reduced. Okay, So what happens exactly here is, so let's assume that now this patient with a normal heart, okay, so normal ven left ventricular size, so this patient has developed uh, heart failure problem. So heart failure problem in the sense initially his ejection fraction, the ventricular ejection fraction, instead of 70%, it has dropped to 55%. Okay. So during that stage, if the patient won't take ACE inhibitors, if the patient won't take ACE inhibitors regularly, then after few months or after one year, what happens is his ejection fraction will further drop from 55 to 45 or 40 percent. And at the same time, his left ventricle, it changes its shape. Okay. So the left ventricle will undergo hypertrophy. That is, it will increase in the size. Okay. And when once it increases in the size, okay, so it loses its elastic contractile property. So that's what we'll study in case of uh, Frank Sterling's law. When a rubber band is stretched, okay, it will recoil. It will come back to normal size. But if we stretch the rubber band to a larger extent, or if we keep on stretching the rubber band to a uh, larger extent for um, more than like uh, five to ten minutes, then what happens? That rubber band it loses its recoiling property. It won't recoil it won't come back to its normal size so that's what it happens with the left ventricle it has got completely stretched so it means that it won't it won't undergo a forceful contact it won't uh, it won't the muscles the cardiac myocytes they won't recoil properly they have lost their elastic recoiling nature so that's what it happens if we won't put the patient on an ACE inhibitor. If the patient won't take the ACE inhibitors in long term, it leads to cause the cardiac remodeling. So ACE inhibitors, they prevent the cardiac remodeling. So not only ACE inhibitors, but also beta blockers. Beta blockers are also one of the most important drugs in heart failure. So beta blockers also, they prevent such cardiac remodeling. And not only the beta blockers, even spironolactone, which is a aldosterone antagonist, it also shows the same property. It also has the same property. That is, it prevents cardiac remodeling. That is, it prevents left ventricular hypertrophy and prevents the development of further cardiac arrhythmias. So why arrhythmias develop here? What is the reason why the heart uh, rate will increase? So the reason here is, okay. So here, you see the left ventricle has enlarged. It has undergone hypertrophy. It has uh, got enlarged. So it means that this left ventricle has failed the forceful contracting property. It is not undergoing a proper systole, that is contraction. So when, when it is not undergoing a proper contraction, then obviously the blood won't be pumped out into the iota properly. Only 30. 35% of the blood is, let's assume that only 35% of the blood is pumping out. Instead of 70%, 35% of the 
only 35 percent is pumping out that is it has dropped up to 50 percent of the total ejection fraction so only 35 percent of the blood is pumping out so now what happens is due to the lack of proper oxygen supply to the tissues okay so as only 35 percent of the blood is pumping out only 35 percent of the blood is reaching to all the organs of the body so less oxygen is uh, reaching to all the organs in the body then immediately the sympathetic system gets activated sympathetic system will recognize that low blood flow okay and sympathetic system will activate and it will keep on releasing noradrenaline okay so it will keep on releasing noradrenaline so we know that when once the noradrenaline is released, noradrenaline will show the action on the beta-1 receptors on the heart. Okay? And when once the beta-1 receptors get activated with more noradrenaline, then the heart rate will increase. Okay? So heart rate will keep on increasing. So it will keep on increasing, increasing, increasing from 70 beats per minute, which is normal uh, heart rates, 70 to 80 beats. From there, the heart rate it may go up to 300 beats per minute or 400 beats per minute okay so that condition is known as the arrhythmias ventricular arrhythmias ventricular tachycardias okay so which may lead to cause the death of the patient again okay? so that what it happens okay so if left ventricle if it undergoes the hypertrophy then obviously the cardiac output will decrease when the cardiac output is decreased, then sympathetic system will get overactivated. Now the sympathetic system will keep on releasing noradrenaline and that noradrenaline will increase the heart rate and that heart rate, sometimes it may go even up to 400 beats per minute. That is the left ventricular fibrillation suckers and it leads to cause the death of the patient. Okay, so that's why if we put the patient on a ACE inhibitor and if we put the patient on a beta blocker, or if we put the patient on a spironolactone, then all these drugs, they prevent such cardiac remodeling or they prevent ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, So by preventing all those conditions, they prolong the life of the patient. They prolong the survival of the patient. Okay, So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, allosterone antagonists, so all these drugs, they prolong the survival of the patient okay now, this is the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors uh, as we all know about this mechanism we have seen we have studied many times so ACE inhibitors they mainly prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 okay so that's the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitors now regarding the side effects of ACE inhibitors. So the first side effect is hyperkalemia. They increase the serum potassium levels. Whereas we know that diuretics, they cause hypokalemia. Diuretics, they decrease the serum potassium levels. And the second adverse effect of the ACE inhibitors is ACE inhibitors, they cause the rash and angioedema. And ACE inhibitors, they also cause the dry cough. So angioedema, dry cough, rash all these side effects are due to increase in bradykinin levels in the body so when we put the patient on ace inhibitors so what happens is ace inhibitors they they block the or they prevent the hydrolysis or the degradation of bradykinins in the body as a result the bradykinin levels gets increased so due to increase in the bradykinin levels it leads to cause dry cough angioedema and rash and other problems in the patient and ACE inhibitors, they increase the serum creatinine levels. So increasing the serum creatinine levels is quite common. So whenever we put the patient on ACE inhibitors, then their serum creatinine level will definitely increase. So this increase is common and increase up to 25% is acceptable. Okay? So up to 25% is acceptable, but if it keeps on increasing beyond that, then we need to um, stop giving ACE inhibitors to the patient. And all the ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy. So we should never give ACE inhibitors in pregnant women. Then ARBs, that is the angiotensin II receptor blockers. So ARBs, 
low saturn, candy saturn, HB saturn, tell me saturn. So all these drugs, they share the same properties as that of the ACE inhibitors. They share the same side effects. They share the same properties as that of ACE inhibitors, except dry cough. ACE inhibitors, they cause the dry cough, whereas ARBs, they won't cause any dry cough. And in patients, those who develop the dry cough with ACE inhibitors, then the doctors, they will switch them over to the angiotensin II receptor blockers. Okay. Now, the next class of the drugs are the beta blockers. So beta blockers, examples are besoprolol, metoprolol, carbidilol. Okay. So these beta blockers, only BMC, that is besoprolol, metoprolol, and carbidilol are the drugs that can be used in heart failure. Okay. And that to metoprolol, not the immediate release, only the sustained release metoprolol is the drug of choice in heart failure. Okay. Then always beta blockers are to be used in combination with ACE inhibitors in the management of heart failure. And these two drug combinations, ACE inhibitors plus beta blocker combination is considered as a first line agents in the management of heart failure. If ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, we can replace it with ARBs, ARB plus beta blockers. These two combinations is considered as the first line in heart failure. And the most important point here is we should not initiate a beta blocker until the patient is stable. That is, hemodynamically, the patient is stable. Or we should not give a beta blocker to the patient when the heart is in a decompensated state. So we need to start giving the beta blocker only when once the heart, it comes back to a compensated state. Okay? So it means that when that excess fluid which is present in the body, it should uh, be removed out from the body first. Then only we need to start the patient on a beta blocker. Okay? So what happens if the heart is in a decompensated state and on top of that, if we start beta blocker to the patient, okay, then we know that beta blockers they also have got a negative inotropic property. That is, they reduce the force of contractions. Okay. So as a result, the patient heart uh, cardiac output will further decrease. The patient becomes hypotensive and other complications will arise. So that's why beta blockers are life-saving drugs. Of course, they are the life-saving drugs, but we should not start the beta blockers like uh, abruptly, we should not start the beta blockers. So we need to start a beta blocker carefully when once the heart it comes back to a compensated condition or when once that excess fluid is removed from the body or when once the patient is hemodynamically stable, then only we need to start the patient on a beta blocker. Now, the advantages of the beta blockers are again the same. Beta blockers also prevent the cardiac remodeling. That's what we have seen with ACE inhibitors. Okay. And the beta blocker, they have a capacity to prevent or to regress left ventricular or the vascular hypertrophy. So that's why beta blockers are considered as the first line drugs in patients with almost all the cardiovascular problems. Like if the patient has hypertension with myocardial infection, hypertension with congestive heart failure, hypertension with any coronary artery disorders, like um, angina pectoris, okay? then beta blockers are to be considered as the first line agents because beta blockers, they have a cardioprotective property. Okay? Then the next class of the drugs are the aldosterone antagonist. The examples for aldosterone antagonist are spironolactone and eplerinone. So these two drugs are aldosterone antagonist. Now, why do we need to give this aldosterone antagonist? So first of all, what is aldosterone? So aldosterone is the hormone which is released by the adrenal gland, adrenal cortex. It releases the mineralocorticoid. And the name of that mineralocorticoid is known as the aldosterone. So its name itself, it indicates that it is a mineralocorticoid. So its major function is it keeps on reabsorbing the sodium and water into the body. So aldosterone, it al always it reabsorbs the sodium and water. Uh, at the collecting duct of nephrons into the systemic circulation, that is into the bloodstream. So as a result, aldosterone, it increases the extracellular fluid volume, it increases the cardiac preload. And aldosterone, 
It also causes the fibrotic changes in the myocardium, like worsening of the systolic dysfunction and pathological remodeling. Again, allosterone on when allosterone keeps on uh, acting on the heart, it leads to cause the cardiac remodeling. That is, left ventricular hypertrophy may occur with the continuous action of the aldosterone in the body. So what happens here is if we give an aldosterone antagonist, okay, so that is the spinolactone, which is a weak diuretic and it is also a potassium sparing diuretic. Okay? So if we put the patient on aldosterone antagonist, then the aldosterone antagonist will block these functions. And aldosterone antagonist, that is the spinolactone, will prevent the left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so that's the advantage of aldosterone antagonist, that is spinolactone. Okay, and the main drawback or the side effect of the spinolactone is they cause the hyperkalemia because the name itself it indicates that they are potassium sparing diuretics. They reabsorb the potassium into the, they conserve more potassium into the body. Okay, so serum potassium levels gets increased and the patient become hyperkalemic. And spinolactone, it also has got another major side effect that is gynecomastia. So epilidinone is the drug which is free of this side effect. So whenever the patient, they develop any gynecomastic symptoms, then we need to switch, switch the patient over to the epilidinone. So that's about allosterone antagonist, that is the spinolactone. And again, when do we need to use this allosterone antagonist? That is when we need to give spinolactone to the patient. So spinolactone is to be given to the patient when the combination of ACE inhibitor and the combination of the beta blocker, the both the drug combinations, when they fail to show the action, then we will add spinolactone to the therapy. Okay. So right at the beginning, like we won't use spinolactone as the first line agent. So we always uh, reserve the spinolactone when once the combination of ACE inhibitors and the beta blockers, they fail to show proper improvement, then we will add the spinolactone. Then the next class of the drug, the last one, and the most important one is digoxin. So digoxin, it is a cardiac glycoside. Okay? So we know that digoxin, it has got a positive inotropic property. So it means that it increases the force of contraction. And the main uh, mechanism of action of the digoxin is it uh, shows the action at the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So it uh, shows the action at that pump and it increases the indirectly, it increases the calcium levels. And due to the increase in the calcium levels, it leads to cause contractions in the cardiac myocyte. So in this diagram, we can have a look through the mechanism of action of digoxin. So digoxin, it shows the action at the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So this pump is the sodium potassium ATPS pump. So digoxin, it, so first of all, let's have a look through what is the function of this pump. So through this pump, there will be three sodium ions, the intracellular sodium ions, three intracellular sodium ions will get flexed out. And in exchange to the three sodium ions, two potassium ions will inflex into the cell. Okay. So three sodium gets flexed out and two potassium will enter into the cell. So this is the function of the sodium potassium ATPS pump. Now, digoxin, if we give the patient digoxin, then digoxin will go and bind to this pump and digoxin will block this pump. So when this pump is blocked up, then the intracellular sodium, it won't get flexed out. Okay. As a result, the sodium concentration within the cell gets increased. When that sodium concentration gets increased, we know that in order to develop an action potential, the main ions which are required are sodium ions. So when that sodium concentration is getting increased, then an action potential will develop. And these sodium ions, they also stimulate the calcium ions which are stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So they also stimulate the calcium ions. Sorry, they also stimulate the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And when once these calcium ions are released, the calcium ions, they bind with the actin and myosin filaments. And when once 
uh, they bind with the actin and myosin filaments and forms the cross bridges between actin and myosin filaments. As a result, it leads to cause the contraction of the cardiac myocyte. So in this way, digoxin indirectly, it is increasing the calcium levels, which helps in contracting the cardiac muscle. So digoxin, it causes the positive inotropic property. That is, it helps in increasing the force of contractions. And there are two uh, things that mainly interacts with the digoxin. One is the potassium levels. Okay? So, and the, uh, like the potassium levels, we can categorize it into uh, increase in serum potassium and decrease in serum potassium levels. Okay? So these two are the factors that mainly they interact with the serum digoxin concentration. So increase in serum uh, potassium levels is known as hyperkalemia. Whereas decrease in serum potassium levels is known as hypokalemia. Okay, so what happens exactly here is so digoxin and potassium they both fight together to bind with the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Okay, so if digoxin levels are more, okay, if digoxin is stronger, then digoxin will bind with this pump and it blocks the sodium potassium ATPase pump. It means that digoxin will prevent the efflux of the sodium ions. But on the other hand, if potassium concentration is higher, okay, so in case of hyperkalemia, what happens here is potassium will fight with digoxin. Okay, and as we know that potassium levels are higher, potassium will win. Okay, So it will bind with the pump and potassium will get inflexed and sodium will come out. It means that in case of hyperkalemic condition, the digoxin's therapeutic effect will get decreased. Okay, so in case of hyperkalemia, the digoxin's therapeutic effect will decrease. On the other hand, in case of hypokalemia, that is when potassium concentration is low. So now what happens here is digoxin will bind, okay, and more amount of the digoxin will bind, and digoxin will keep on showing the action, and it may go to it or it may reach to toxic levels okay so hypokalemia will lead to cause excess digoxin of action and sometimes it may also show the toxic effects of digoxin whereas hyperkalemia will decrease the digoxin actions okay and it shows the subtherapeutic effect of digoxin okay then this is the most important thing that you guys need to know uh, regarding digoxin. So the accepted therapeutic range of digoxin is 0 0.5 to 2 micrograms per liter. But ideally, so in most of the elder patients and those who have this renal impairment issues, okay, so our target range will be 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 micrograms per liter. Okay. Because in most of the cases, when once the serum uh, target levels the digoxin target levels, even if it reaches to 1.2, then immediately the patient, they will start showing the side effects, the toxic effects of digoxin. So that's why we'll never target up to two. Okay, So always our target is 0 0.5 to 0.8 micrograms per liter. Now, let's have a look through what are the toxic uh, effects of this digoxin. So when once the digoxin levels, then, uh, it reaches to the toxic range that is even if it goes up to 1.2 then immediately the patients they will start developing the symptoms okay, the toxicity symptoms and the main toxicity symptoms the first symptoms that can be seen are the gastrointestinal symptoms okay. so the gastric symptoms are the first symptoms like nausea anorexia vomiting so these are the first signs of digoxin toxicity okay. and after developing the dog's, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Later, the patient will develop the cardiac symptoms, like cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, So these are the uh, common toxic side effects of digoxin. And usually, the digoxin's steady state concentration will be reached after seven days. In case if the patient has a normal renal function, then it takes at least seven days to reach the steady state concentration. Okay. And in case if the patient has the renal impairment, then it may take longer time. Okay, instead of seven days, it may go even up to 14 days or 15 days to reach the steady state concentration. Okay, 
So the half-life of digoxin is 36 hours. And for any drug to reach the steady state concentration, it needs at least four to five half-lives. Okay, let's take five half-lives, five times 36 hours, okay, roughly around. It takes seven days for the drug to reach the steady state concentration. So it means that we measure the therapeutic levels of digoxin. We'll take the sample and measure the digoxin levels only when once the digoxin reaches the steady state concentration. So before that, we should not measure the steady state concentration of digoxin. Okay, And that too, we need to take the blood sample at least six hours after the dose to allow proper distribution of the digoxin. So after giving the digoxin dose, we need to wait at least six hours for the drug to get distributed. Then only we need to collect the serum sample. So these are a few important points that are related to the digoxin. And all these points are mainly related to, to the uh, target or therapeutic range of digoxin. Okay. So finally, this is the overview of the topic, guys. So from this slide, we can come to know that what class of the drugs are to be considered as the first line agents in the management of congestive heart failure. So whenever the patient, they present with uh, heart failure problems, heart failure symptoms. So the first drugs, first line drugs that we need to give to the patient are the ACE inhibitors, okay? like enalapril, lisinopril, ramipril, perintopril, all are the ACE inhibitors. If ACE inhibitors are contraindicated, then we can give ARBs. Okay? But ACE inhibitors or ARBs are considered as first line agents. And along with ACE inhibitors, so we must also give beta blockers to the patient. Always we must combine beta blockers with ACE inhibitors. And the most important point that I mentioned uh, earlier was, so we should not give beta blocker to the patient when the heart is in a decompensated state. So we need to wait until the heart comes back into a compensated state. Okay? Then we can start the patient on a beta blocker. Okay. So ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, these two are the mandatory drugs. Then diuretics. So diuretics, they also play a major role in heart failure. So diuretics are to be given only when required. Whenever the patient has congestion or whenever the patient has the fluid overload, then only we'll give diuretics to the patient. Okay. Otherwise, we won't give diuretics to the patient. Then spinolactone. Spinolactone, which is an aldosterone antagonist, okay, and it is also a potassium sparing diuretic. So this spinolactone is to be added to the initial therapy, initial therapy in the sense a combination of ACE inhibitor and beta blocker therapy. So spinolactone is to be added to the initial therapy where the first line agents, they fail to show improvement in symptoms. So here the first line agents are ACE inhibitors plus beta blocker combinations. So if they fail to show the uh, implement in the symptoms, then we can put the patient on spinolactone. And always digoxin. Digoxin is always considered as the last option where the ejection fraction is too low okay, or there is a minimal response with the initial therapy, then only we need to put the patient on digoxin. Okay. So because we know that digoxin, it won't uh, help in prolonging the survival of the patient. And in long term, if we put the patient on a digoxin for a long term and at the uh, higher doses, then what happens is, so the only function of the digoxin is to improve the pumping of the heart. So that's the only role of digoxin. It will keep on uh, increasing the force of contractions. So it will keep on increasing the pumping of the heart. Okay. So what happens is, in long term, like if the patient is on digoxin at a higher doses for a uh, long term, that is for two years or three years, then what happens is after pumping, uh, like after continuous uh, systoles or the continuous increase in uh, positive inotropic property, so the ventricles, they undergo hypertrophy. The ventricles, they become uh, hypertrophic in nature. Okay, So that's why we'll never try to put the patient on digoxin as a first line. And also when we put the patient on digoxin, so we always try to make sure that we need to reduce the dose to 
as small as possible okay and we should not put the patient on digoxin for a long term okay so these are the few uh, important take home points related to the congestive heart failure